uh, everyone, uh, Pranam to all of you. And uh, thank you for uh, joining our meeting for May 2024. Uh, the topic that was actually communicated for uh, today's uh, uh, meeting was uh, or is uh, insights into self-abidance. So uh, that that's quite a interesting uh, and a very wide spectrum you know covered by this uh, title. Uh, let's actually uh, start with a few examples where we can correlate the uh, title of this uh, topic. Uh, you know, most of you would be going for a walk, uh, you know, a couple of times a week, and uh, you will be very familiar, you know, where actually you go for a walk. So when you go for the walk, try to, you know, recollect uh, that in your mind. And as you go to the walk, and then when you come back, you see different sites, you know, you know, the trees, the houses, the pathway, and where you normally go. That's quite a familiar experience with everyone. So what we are viewing during this walk is what we call as the insights, uh, you know, of your walk, right? So uh, I'm, I'm focusing on the word actually insight here. Now let's take it a little bit uh, closer. You see, you just uh, reflect back on your current life from the time that actually you were born right up to this present moment when we are actually having this discussion. So, you know, whatever events or activities have actually taken place uh, uh, you know, during this current life of yours, we call that as your insights into your present life, right? So then we move a bit more closer to basically the title of this topic. Now, actually, you see, you go within yourself where your mental body and your astral body is. These are the sources of your thoughts and your feelings. Now, this is your own inner world, and this is where you are actually exploring or becoming familiar with what you call as your mental concepts and the feelings which are actually associated with those mental concepts. So that is what we may call as the inner world of a human being and the insights that are taking place, which take place all the time and are not in their totality shared with others that's uh, that's the insight into your world of thinking and your world of feeling right now you see uh, you know as we have uh, discussed on previous uh, uh, spiritual meetings we are moving from one life to another and each life has its own insights but there is something hidden within every human being that one is seeking. So when I was reflecting on this, basically, we are all actually seeking happiness, isn't it? Whatever you do, you are actually seeking some peace, some happiness in that. But you see, when it is related to this, it is only temporary. So now you see, what we are talking about is that after having journeyed through many lifetimes and after a wide search, then suddenly actually you look up that look, what is the purpose of this human life, right? And that purpose is very well, uh, you know, told to us by some of the, uh, you see, uh, enlightened or illuminated uh, beings that came like uh, Rishi Master Vyansa Duno and this center, you know, center of learning uh, in Sydney, you know, Ramna Maharishi is the center of learning Sydney, Ramna Maharishi himself being an outstanding example of this. So what happens is that this is basically your spiritual journey. And what has happened in the spiritual journey is that uh, one has wandered along different pathways, right? Until you actually come across an illuminated master, you know, let's just take the example of Ramna Maharishi and maybe some of his students who the sage has actually helped to experience that same state at what, what the sage 
had actually experienced. Now, this is where actually we come to the very crux of this uh, topic, which is insights into self-abidance. So you see, one is moving towards self-abidance, and the other is that you are in self-abidance. So one is while moving towards self-abidance, there are insights which come to you, which are your own direct experiences of the reality, right? And then when you are in self-abidance, then you are in oneness with that reality or what we call as, uh, you know, a Brahman or uh, God or that spaceless, timeless reality, consciousness. And then you see, while still living in the human form, then there are further new, deeper insights which are communicated by the reality itself, right? So just uh, actually let us uh, share uh, you know, some of these uh, deep insights. So all of you are actually now uh, present here and listening to this uh, satsang or this spiritual uh, discussion. And the only way that it is actually possible is by becoming conscious, right? So being conscious is linked to or a direct attribute of consciousness itself. Right, so that is one insight. Another simple insight uh, we actually look into it is, you see, the light comes from the sun. Right now, this light which is coming from the sun helps this, uh, you know, body complex to view or become aware of the surroundings. But look at it very carefully. There is something within you which actually reminds you of your own reality or your own individuality. And it is basically in that illuminating light of consciousness, basically, that we see the sun, we view the light of that sun, and we become conscious of external objects. So here, what we are looking at is that this insight actually gives us the most beautiful attribute of consciousness, that that which is self-illuminated, right? And then there is another insight given by uh, sages like Sage Ribu, uh, Shankaracharya, Ramana Maharishi. They say that all these images basically which are there is also none other than the same reality, but appearing as what we call as changing reality means something which is actually appearing and disappearing, but all this is actually still seen on the screen of consciousness, right? So these are some deeper insights that we come across or are given to us by, you see, uh, those who are actually illuminated. One of the uh, insights or a few insights while you're on the pathway to self-abidance and when you are guided is that one is that, look, you will only be actually really able to realize or experience or be in tune with that, you know, uh, presence of that uh, almighty or consciousness, only when you distance yourself from your own thoughts, your own mental concepts, and your own feelings, and this so-called events of your personal life. So, uh, you see, from a long time ago, you know, passing through the ages, this wisdom has been passed down by the sages that what you do is that you start by simply uh, being a silent observer or a witness, right? And what they say is that when you're actually witnessing, then basically it's not simply witnessing the thoughts or the feelings. You are actually witnessing yourself, the individual, and all these activities that this individual does, and then by that practice, the, a gap is created between that which is witnessing, which is none other than consciousness itself, witnessing the images, and then there is yourself, your mind, and these activities. And when this gap comes, right, that is when you start experiencing that reality. Now, what is it that actually, what leads to, uh, you see, this experience? What actually leads to you is, and actually very simple, what you understand is that, look, there are two things. One is actually apparent, and the other is ultimate. 
So what is this apparent? You see, apparent means apparent reality or that reality which is simply appearing and disappearing. And then actually you realize that, look, what I've been thinking upon myself, that I'm actually Anilji or I'm Chanji or I'm Suzanne, basically that belongs to apparent reality, that which has come and one day is actually bound to disappear right and then actually you reflect upon this and actually you see that apparent reality is what you're associating yourself with and that is your normal day-to-day -day experience things appearing and then actually disappearing and you've associated yourself with that for so long and then you look at the witness and you see that oh you see the witness doesn't belong to the mind belongs to consciousness because every time when you come back to witnessing, it is the same function which does not change. And then you realize the presence of what we call as the ultimate reality, and that is actually consciousness, right? So these are just uh, some of the inner insights uh, which I've mentioned uh, while on the pathway to self-abidance. And then when you've attained self-abidance, what the reality uh, communicates. So uh, with just uh, this uh, short uh, introduction, I'll request Amar Suji to, uh, you know, prepare the, the slides uh, which he wants to bring forth. Uh, Amar Suji is a very old uh, member of our, you know, spiritual community. And uh, at least once a year, he does come and uh, put forward his views. So uh, he will be actually... Uh, taking us uh, further with this talk. Uh, thank you, uh, Amar Suji, if you can please take over. Thank you. Uh, Anilji, thank you very much and uh, Namaskar to everyone. And Anilji, thank you for this wonderful introduction. I think you have uh, probably summed up everything which I want to explain today about our insights into self-abidance. And uh, I, I just uh, definitely want to start with a very positive note that we all have experienced self-abidance. Only thing is, Sometimes we are not aware that we have gone through this experience. So I'm really going to put in very simple words and I've taken some basic concepts or uh, which have been put forward by Ramana Maharishi and as well as, as by our scriptures. So uh, starting with the, uh, uh, the first slide, as you can see, uh, the insights as uh, Sunilji, uh, Anilji very nicely mentioned that we are trying to acquire knowledge or wisdom to our experiences in our life. And it does provide us practical guidance uh, on how to navigate our life, relationships, challenges, while maintaining our inner peace. And when we talk about insights into self-abidance, we are definitely talking about gaining a deeper understanding of one state of being, existence, and presence. I think presence is a very important word. And in order to achieve these insights, we are provided with the tools for introspection, which I'll talk about those tools in the next slide. So we are looking at tools for introspections and we will also be doing self-reflection and exploring our inner thoughts, emotions and experiences. And then we can look at our the patterns, habits and aspects of our, of our own nature, which will contribute to our sense of self or our realizing the self. Now, the word glimpse, uh, insights also means glimpses, which means a, when we get a glimpse, it acts as a catalyst for us. And catalyst basically means it will help us to explore further and ask questions. And also, it will create some kind of curiosity and it, that it does invite contempla contemplation. And it further leads to unlocking the meaningful understanding uh, into the deeper uh, truth. Uh, I will go on to the next slide. And uh, as I mentioned just now, uh, let's look at the tools we have, which are available to us uh, uh, to have the experiences of, about self-abidance. And we all are familiar with these tools. And uh, these tools are also called inner organs of our subtle body. And we all are familiar with these four, the way we divide our these in, uh, internal tools or inner organs into four parts. The first being called man, man, or we call it manas or mind, which is a lower part of the mind. And it connects us with the external world, basically with the five senses from where we get the 
information and it also uh, is a seat of desire and also a seat of will and resolution. So it all happens through sensory organs. And then we go to the next part, which is called uh, uh, silence and serenity. And it is also called a subconscious mind, which is storing our memory and cosmic intelligence. So it is a storehouse of impressions, memories and experiences. And that's where we go back and collect the impressions we have created and try to relate it when we are making a decision. And in Sanskrit, it is called chit or chitta. And the third one is called the intellect or the buddhi, or as mentioned in the diagram here, it is called discriminating faculty. It is a decision-making part, which we all know that it tells us the difference between right and wrong, truth and false, as per our uh, you know, information collected by our memory. And then it helps us in making a decision. And uh, last but not least, we talk about the fourth aspect of our mind, which is Atman, or uh, the, uh, which is uh, attaching our uh, self with the body, and it leads to the creation of the word I, sense of I, and which is called the ego. So these, uh, when we are in the three states of consciousness, that is when we are, when we are um, uh, awake uh, and uh, sleep, and deep sleep, uh, these, uh, the first two states, uh, in, uh, which is, uh, they do work, and uh, in the waking and dreaming, and, uh, the, and the, but they are dormant in the third state, which is in the deep sleep. So these are the organs which are given to us, and that will help us in having some reflections, and later on, looking at some of the insights on self avoidance And when I'm using the word self avoidance I, I hear means, basically our experience of the self, which we energy and we all of us use different words called consciousness or awareness or even the word self. Now, uh, in order to uh, have a further discussion, I thought I would take help from some of the words which are used quite often in our literature. It is called surrender is one word which is commonly used. And the second word which I have seen which is used commonly is called the grace. and to support the grace and surrender, I will also uh, talk about being in the present. And so if uh, these three concepts put together, I believe definitely helps us in having first-hand experience of self-abidance. Now, when we talk of the word surrender, Ramana Maharshi has put it in a very uh, simple and a very eloquent manner. He says there are two ways to find or have an experience of self-abidance. This is one is you ask yourself, who am I? Which we all are familiar with, and it is called the path of knowledge or the Jnana Yoga. Or he says the second method is quite simple and that method is called surrender. And surrender means it is a path of devotion. So like a child who has blind trust in on the mother, whatever she does for her, he simply trusts and submits all, all everything to his mother. And that's what is a simple example of a uh, surrender. And whereas uh, when we talk of knowledge of the self, then definitely we are talking about who am I? That is a different path, which is called the path of knowledge. Now, when you have the total surrender, there is no place for ego. So I can clearly say that trust is inversely proportional to the ego. Higher the trust, lower the ego. And that's what is the state of a person who has made it, who has surrendered, and all his actions are dedicated, uh, and has no attachment to the actions. And the best part is the person is always present in the present state of mind. We'll talk about uh, the the steps regarding uh, uh, non-attachment a little later. Let's first now look at how we can be in the present. So I'm going to talk some of the methods because it is very easily explained and we do understand the concept of being in the present, but how to experience that because being in the present itself is the first state or the first step that takes us towards uh, surrender or towards our self-abidance. Now, the first uh, method which is mentioned for self-abidance or being to being in the present is called that we engage our senses. And the best example I can see of engaging our senses is 
an example when you visit an Indian temple where you see all the four senses working uh, uh, together. You can see a deity, which is a sight of a deity. You can hear the sound of a conch or a bell ringing in the temple. You can smell the flowers or the incense sticks. So all these, uh, and uh, you can also uh, feel the air or the area around that. And you have that sense of thought, which is very pure and divine. And of course, last but not the least, you do get a prasadam, which is using the fifth sense. So uh, we'll uh, be discussing a little more on this, about using the senses in our day-to-day -day life. But definitely, when we start to engage our senses in the present moment, it helps us to be in the present. Now, the second uh, aspect which helps us to be in the present is the to bring in gratitude in the, for the present moment, not of gratitude as in the past, what has happened in our lives, but acknowledging the blessings and the gifts in, you, in our life on our day-to-day -day basis. We get up in the morning and you feel that you are feeling good and you're healthy and you're still alive. Itself is, a, is one way to feel gratitude about or being in present. I was just looking at uh, um, internet and I came across a very simple uh, um, uh, uh, information where it said only 12% people of the world, they cross the age of 60. And many of us who are 60 plus or around that, so we are already uh, among those 12% of the people. So that itself makes us feel that we should be thankful of that feeling of gratitude. So gratitude in the present moment is also very uh, important for moving towards self-abidance. And it is uh, definitely a very simple tool and it keeps our mind positive and I think that really helps. And the next uh, part for to be remaining present for self-abidance would be to let go the thoughts and distractions. distractions. Now, when we say let go of the thoughts, because the mind has a tendency to wander and we see that we either go in the past or the future and we miss the present moment. And that takes us away from self-abidance. So the simple technique mentioned by the sages is that you acknowledge the thoughts, you then let it go. Do not stick to the thought and then you come back to the present moment. And for that, solitude is a very good tool again to uh, stay in the present moment and let go the thoughts. And when we talk of distractions, now we have so-called and uh, the word around us where we get all the distractions. So when we said let go the thoughts, we were talking about uh, inside our mind and that's where the thoughts appear. But when we talk of distractions, we are basically talking about the distractions from the outside world or from the external world, like social media and multitasking, and uh, things which uh, draw our attention. And that again takes us away from the present moment. It is not possible for normal humans to stay in present all the time. But if we can go back to the present moment after we have attended to the task or even the thought which has come to us, that itself is a very good uh, situation to be. So for that purpose, we can use physical anchors which will bring us back to the present moment. And probably you, uh, some of you have already experienced a very common yoga, which is done by uh, the yoga practitioners called the Shava Asan, where they ask you to lie down and feel as if you are a dead body and then start feeling different parts of your body. And so your focus is on different parts or different limbs of your body. And that brings you back to the present moment then you are not thinking of any other thoughts. So we can use different anchors in our day-to-day uh, -day life when we distract or we get away from the present moment. Going further on the same uh, topic of being on the present, uh, we are all familiar with the word with, uh, or, or with the uh, practice of focusing on our breath. And uh, we all know that this is uh, quite com very well used especially in uh, meditation. So I'll put meditation and uh, focusing on breath as a very good, again, tool to be in the present. When we focus on our breath, it means that we can feel the sensation of 
the breath entering into our body through our nostrils and leaving it. So the, we use different breathing techniques for that purpose. And then when you sit in meditation, then you again come back and you focus on the present moment. That is by quartering your mind. And to start with, maybe we are focusing on the breath and later on you know, we leave that and we stay on the present moment. So these are the two common techniques which are used in meditation for being in the present. If your mind starts to wander, then you have to bring it back because it means it's either going to the past or future. So these are two important uh, methods which are uh, you know, interconnected when we talk of meditation. And now the next uh, way we can, uh, the way we can look at things around us is to look at impermanence. It means that we know that everything is constantly changing and the present moment is the all that exists. And everything is transitory and it, uh, except for the real self. And once we can remind ourselves, as in when we see a situation you know, happening in our lives, knowing fully well that it is just a situation and not our life or not our consciousness. And that also will bring us back to the present moment. So looking at things as uh, uh, real or unreal, temporary or permanent, inanimate or animate, all these things help us to bring us back to the present moment. And of course, we can use different reminders. And these reminders can come in the form of different stories. And uh, one common story which uh, comes to my mind all the time is, well, uh, as Buddha says, that uh, if you are born, you are born to die. You cannot avoid it. And so, the, and in other words, nothing is forever or nothing is permanent except for the change. So, uh, uh, as for Buddha says, you have to make peace with it. And you know that if you're born, there, if there's a beginning, there has to be an end. And we all have to go through the process of old age, disease and death. And that reminder will help us to go back to the situation of, of you know, permanent versus uh, imper impermanent and also focusing on the present moment. And uh, uh, now to sum up uh, um, this uh, being in the present and talking about the surrender, I uh, on purpose uh, left uh, the summary or the, or the, or the crux of this uh, 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 topic of surrender to the last point, which is called Ishwar Pranidhan in Sanskrit, which means surrender to the self or to the divine. That's what we are discussing. And we just mentioned that if we are in the present moment, it, we are getting closer to self-abidance. Now, according to uh, Patanjali Yoga Darshan, uh, 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 the, the, uh, it does mention about certain practices for self-discipline we should be doing to improve our uh, personal growth and to focus on self. And in this, they talk of yama and niyamas. And in niyamas, which are called self-discipline, it talks about the five aspects, which are briefly called purity, contentment, self-discipline, self-study, and surrender to the divine. And that is the one we are discussing right now. We are here, it is discussed in a little more detail after talking about being in the present. What does the word self-surrender means or surrendering to the self? It says when you surrender, you are surrendering for the higher purpose. That is the higher purpose. And here the higher purpose is having realizing the self. And when you are doing, you need to enter into selfless action. In other words, you are not after desire for, you don't desire for fame or recognition, or you are not attached towards your family or children, or you are not um, uh, uh, have a desire to hold uh, for holding and material accumulation, and you don't even desire to have a longer life. So when you put all these things to, uh, 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 and you say that these are not all in, but it's impermanent and you want to go for something which is permanent and that is the higher purpose. And that's when the surrender or the self uh, 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 issue, it starts. And once you have set yourself that you have to work for this higher purpose, uh, it leads to because of being in the present, you feel the presence and then you feel the presence of self in all the activities you have undertake because your actions become selfless and you are not alone as self because self is with you all the time and 
you act as directed by the awareness or by the inner voice. So the next level, which once you have submitted yourself to the higher purpose, you feel that whatever actions you are going to under, you undertake, they are directed by your inner voice or which we can also call it as by your self or the consciousness. And once you have done that, you will also will see that you will have unbroken gratitude and remembrance of the self. And when I use our remembrance means you may be doing day-to-day -day activities, you may be busy in your uh, leading a daily life, but once you get a bit of a free time or a break time in between, it will automatically pull you back to yourself like a magnet attracts the RN particles. So all the activities of the world, when you have done this, so when you have surrendered, you will go back to the root and the root here is about your self-realization or about your uh, consciousness or awareness. So these are some of the things we can do to be in the present. And this is what how we can surrender. And once we do the surrender, we move to the next part of uh, self abidance which is called grace. And again, uh, we will probably see that Ramana Maharishi talks about the word grace all the time. And he mentions that your uh, uh, grace is your guru. When he says guru, it doesn't mean the guru in the physical sense, but here what probably it means is the teachings of Ramana Maharishi uh, are uh, uh, directing us to uh, obtain the grace of the guru. And it comes by listening, contemplation, reflection, and constant remembrance of the teachings of the guru. And that's what probably we are doing right now when we are talking about the teachings of Ramana Maharishi and so that they become our second nature and then we live with it and it becomes then you feel the grace of uh, the self all the time. But we will still, uh, we'll move on a bit further and here it really says you become from seeker to seer, you remain in the present and you uh, your mind becomes quiet and you have only one thought or rather all your thoughts direct you towards yourself. So uh, we can still again do some of the practices which I mentioned earlier and I'm going to add some more practices which probably will help us to obtain this grace and also leading us towards self-realization. The first one of course is called observation which stands for uh, that we are developing this ability to observe our thoughts and emotions and we do it without judgment. So in other words, the way our mind works, once we can see that the mind is, uh, has, uh, we have uh, discussed the four aspects of our mind uh, and we can see each one of uh, that operating and then you just observe them uh, within your own body and the way they operate and you judge them uh, without any judgment, but you do it while keeping a focus on the present moment, which we discussed earlier. So observation is a very good tool. And the moment you start observing, in other words, if uh, something is happening to uh, Amar, so Amar is just observing the, the way Amar reacts or the way Amar behaves. And this observation uh, separates you from uh, uh, the ego or the I. And that observation will take you closer to your self-abidance. And then... Uh, it also talks about the witness, which is uh, from observation, uh, if uh, is without judgment. And then you, uh, with observation, it is quite common that you will be able to witness also the way uh, your mind behaves. And then here you can distinguish between the self and your, and your body, the way it reacts with your mind, intellect, and um, uh, ego. So uh, observation and witnesses, wit witness consciousness, they both help you to separate. In other words, when you are observing your witness consciousness, you are not a part of the mind. You can see the functions of the mind very clearly and you are you consider yourself away or separate from it. And that again helps you to observe and probably it will definitely help in getting the grace which is always present. So you are getting closer to that. We have discussed about uh, breath awareness earlier and uh, this is very well practiced these days uh, where we when uh, observe our breath and we try to quieten the mind. We, this is practiced quite a lot 
in uh, mindfulness. You, some of you probably have come across. So they focus on your breath and they focus on quieting the mind. And then again, you feel closer to yourself. And also the art of living is another area which is uh, very popular. And that's where they also teach uh, about how to breathe properly and how to quieten the mind and then how to feel closer to yourself. Now, the next one is uh, practice in grace is mantra repetition. Now, it is not that uh, you are just repeating a word and it will help you to uh, get closer to uh, self abidance But your immersion in the mantra that you get so much, uh, you know, engrossed into it, you get go so much deep into it that later on you even drop the mantra and what remains is your experience of self-abidance. So uh, probably in Bible they say you can enter the kingdom of heaven. When we talk of entering into the kingdom of heaven, we are talking exactly, we have dropped your mind, you have dropped all your thoughts and what you experience is your pure, ever-shining self and that. So this is one tool which can help us to get closer to our self-abidance. And self-inquiry is one thing which we all are quite familiar. And uh, we have discussed in many other lectures and uh, we all the time talk about who am I. So probably I don't have to uh, go into detail. And uh, we all uh, know that how self-inquiry is very helpful and it will uh, definitely help us in getting closer to our self-abidance. Going further into the practices of uh, grace where we can feel the sense of uh, um, uh, having the experiencing the grace of the self is by inner purification. Here again, we are focusing on our physical body, where we find that our mind is not resting and it is not quiet. People try to work on their diet or even they go on, go on fasting so that they, it can bring them back to the present moment and so that and they can get connected to the inner self. So this is called Shodhan in Sanskrit and it is used by quite, it is quite popular in one of the sects in India called Indianism. Their fasting is a very big tool they use for inner purification and it, it does bring you closer to your inner self. And then uh, the next uh, uh, you know, tool which I'm talking is about non-attachment. And uh, this is uh, discussed in uh, our literature at length, whether we talk of Shankaracharya in Vivek Churamani or other uh, you know, literatures, where they say that if you have developed the power of discrimination and you practice no attachment, uh, it will lead you to no, no attachment. And so you remain um, uh, 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 unattached to the things happening around you because you know that everything is temporary and it is not permanent and you go after something which is there with you all the time. So Buddha also says that when you start to discriminate, it will lead to an attachment. So uh, non-attachment, uh, as we call it, Vivek and Vairagya. So these two things also helps us in quietening our mind and then feeling closer to the inner self. And uh, uh, going to the selfless service, uh, yes, after non-attachment, uh, going to the selfless service, is, which is a part of, uh, we call the Karam Yoga. And it is uh, where you serve without anything in return, which we talked in Ishra Pranidhan earlier, and uh, where you do a selfless service and still focus on the present moment. And it will help you to develop inner peace, which again leads you to self abidance and uh, in uh, again, going back to some of the sects in India, in, Sikhis, in Sikhism, this is very well accepted and practiced everywhere. They talk about self-service. And another example which comes to mind is about Mother Teresa. And she also preached a lot of, uh, you know, doing self-service or serving poor. So this is another thing which will take you back to your inner peace and which will connect to the inner self or again, taking you close to the self-abidance. Now, the next one uh, for the grace, I will talk about uh, calling connection with the nature. It is called Prakriti Sadhana. And uh, I will say that when you spend time in nature, you're observing its cycles and rhythms and you stay in the present and you then connect with the natural world. 
and I don't have to uh, talk a lot about it because every week we are very fortunate that Anilji in his posts on our WhatsApp group talks about his walks around Sydney and then he mentions about uh, uh, connects his observations and his experiences and he takes the example of the nature and the beauty and the flower and the fauna he sees around and then he talks about this. So this definitely helps us in again getting close to your uh, inner self and which of course uh, helps you in having to staying in self abidance And the last tool which I'm talking about is about devotion, which is called cultivating love and devotion for the present moment and recognizing the divine in all aspects of life. And many people like Ramakrishna, uh, Paramhans, and many other scholars or sages in India have in the Bhakti Yoga, they have uh, uh, talked about uh, love and devotion uh, and staying again in the present moment. So uh, looking at what we have so far discussed about uh, being in the present moment and then surrender and the grace, so all these three things are all actually all in one and because they all lead to one objective as we are, and that is our experience into self-abidance. So what happens when you have gone through the self-abidance? I'm going to give you some examples and I'm sure you'll be able to relate with these ones. So when you are in self-abidance, as I mentioned earlier, we all have experience of this self-abidance. And the first thing is that when you have a sense of peace, comfort, and guidance in times of need and uncertainty. I think we all have experienced this. So this is one aspect of self-abidance. Number two, when we experience forgiveness and healing, when we believe, uh, as I mentioned, you let it go, you know, and you, uh, uh, you, you accept the way things are, that means you are definitely getting closer to your self-abidance. The next one I mentioned here is feeling a sense of joy and uh, love and connection with oneself and others and the world around. So joy, love, peace, and you connect to oneself and the uh, world around. You probably would have seen uh, Ramana Maharishi looking after the, uh, uh, what do you call the cattle or the animals or the, or the birds in, the, uh, in his ashram and connecting with all of them. And they all had that feeling of peace and joy around him. So that itself is an example of self-abidance. And also feeling a sense of gratitude, humility, and surrender in the face of life, mysteries, and uncertainties. There are a lot of things which we don't understand and we don't have answers. When you submit and accept it as when you surrender, that itself is an example of self-abidance because you have that sense of gratitude and humility and you trust that things will turn out to be what is good for you. So that's another example. And going further, so when we are in wonder or in awe of nature, like we find, uh, you know, uh, things uh, like uh, I mentioned earlier, when uh, energy connects with the nature, or we have friends who connect with music or art or any other aspect of life, that itself is an example of self-abidance. And then receiving guidance and wisdom and discernment in making decisions and navigating life's journey, that itself, you feel a sense of self-abidance. And then experiencing a sense of God's presence, love, grace in everyday movement and experience again is self-abidance. So these are some of the examples I can think of. And I'm sure we all have gone through, like Anirvi was asking me at the beginning, that have we got some examples. I'm sure you all will be able to share some examples where you could clearly see. The grace is there all the time. All we need to do is to probably tune into it and have that uh, uh, mindset uh, and then we start to feel the presence of grace, which is always there, but we can also experience it in our thoughts and in our other experiences. So we, uh, I will go back to where we started. The four tools given to us, uh, mind uh, and uh, uh, intellect and our uh, 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 mind, body, and uh, sorry, mind, intellect, and uh, our uh, chitta. Uh, we use all these uh, four uh, internal organs for, uh, and we use contemplation, which I've done through different 
uh, Max had mentioned earlier, and of course, meditation is uh, another one of them. And with the help of this knowledge, we go and achieve our selfhood or our experience of the self. And then once we achieve that, and we hope to stay connected with that. Now, I will uh, just uh, 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 almost finish my presentation with the words which Anilji had just put in uh, uh, his uh, in WhatsApp group. Probably you, probably most of you would have seen it. I'll just read it because it's only a few lines. It says, "May divine consciousness make me awake and aware. May I see the world with clarity and care. May my thoughts be pure, my heart be light." May I, may I be present in each moment, uh, day and night. May I recognize the divine in all I see and honor the interconnectedness of you and me. May this awakening be a source of love and peace. May I use to make it the word a better release. So with this, I will uh, probably uh, end my presentation. And uh, uh, the last thing which I'll say is which, and I'll I'll st I'll stop there with the last slide, and then I'll hand over to Vijay Ji, to and everyone else to uh, uh, please contribute. Thank you for listening to me, and uh, thanks to all of you. Om Sarve Bhyo Namah. Okay, thank you, uh, Amar Ji. Uh, that's a real clinical presentation of uh, the insights into self abidance. Uh, Vijay ji, can you please uh, summarize? Uh, yes, thank you, Anil ji. Uh, we'll just uh, start with three ohms. Om. <laughs> Om. Om. Yeah, dear seekers in the divine, uh, we are gathered here and we are discussing about this topic which Anilji has mentioned, insights into self-abidance. Uh, and uh, as Anilji mentioned, the insights are kind of discussed in two parts. One is the insights during the journey on the path when one is actually going through um the sa uh, sadhana as they call it the the study and the working through to try and find one's true nature and that is one and the second part is when one when the sense of ego and the sense of i has gone and one is abiding as self and abiding as silence, how that functionality uh, expresses itself. So the first part, as uh, Amarji mentioned, during the journey is when he he discussed about the uh, four parts of the mind as such. One is manaha, buddhi, chitta, and ahankar. So mana is the the kind of conscious mind that we are discussing. And then he spoke about the you know, buddhi, which is the intellect, which is used as a tool to discern, discernment or discriminate or discern between what is good, what is bad, what is uh, uh, the differences between the two uh, polar opposites, which the mind is flitting from and doing the right thing, as it were. Then chitta is the, um, he termed it as silence and serenity, which is basically the storage of impressions on this mind, in the cauldron of the mind. Storage of impressions. And that's where, when he mentioned about, uh, Amarji mentioned about um, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, the very first or second verse talks about uh, the eradication of these or vanquishing, as it were, of the impressions on the chitta. Chitta vritti nirodaha means that's 
the vanquishing, that is yoga. Yoga is the union with the self. Yoga, yoga means union. And the union is basically the changing and the changeless. Being the same, just there is unison. That is yoga in true reality. At the moment, when the ego, the I is there, the little I self, the there is a differentiation. One does not relate to the changeless, is always considering that I am this body, mind, intellect. That's all I am. I'm not that pure, infinite, true, changeless, absolute self. And yoga is the union that bonds the basically the dis disillusion of that changing into the changeless. Although the changing is exactly the same as the cha changeless. And then the, the last part is basically the ego, which is the sense, <clears throat> the sense of the I, sense of self, sense of doership that the individual has. So these are the four parts of the mind as discussed. Um, and then the ways and the methods and the insights of going through this sadhana, as it were, which is the uh, practices, is surrender and grace. So surrender is one method where when that sense of I, when the sense of the little ego self is there, that has to be surrendered. And the various methods that um, were discussed were being in the present as presence. The conscious mind will think about not presence, but being in the present because the body is associated as I. So rather than dwelling in the past and fabricating the future, one is being trying to be present in that moment as opposed to being as presence. Then having the sense of gratitude, letting go of thoughts and then focusing on the breath. That's one method. Meditation. Um etc etc and then he men uh, he mentioned about the uh, surrender to the self which is ishwar pranidhan so you're holding an entity as a god in whatever form it may be physical form or imperceptible form manifested form or unmanifested form it really does not matter but the offering of that little ego self to that entity that one considers as the supreme so when that is done the thinning away of the mind happens and that in combination with grace and grace is always there one only needs to tap into the grace that is very very important grace is always there. But the ego does not realize that the grace is always present. It's only the I that is doing the work is what the connotation of the ego is because I am the doer. Grace is there or not there but I am doing it. I am achieving it. That sense of limitedness does not allow grace to be tuned to. So the option is when all these practices are done, such as observe, witness consciousness, I mean breath, breath awareness, mantra repetition, which was discussed, self-inquiry, inner purif purification. Purification can be of two kinds. Purification through eating healthy sattvic food which does not cause the mind to be agitated
and purification can also entail the intake of thoughts which are pure not allowing all kinds of you know thoughts that agitate the mind now the key word is agitation whether it is the intake of food physically or intake of thoughts mentally both these as long as the agitation is prevented that is the key that helps to settle down give one that sense of peace the mind gets calm and peaceful non attachment or the other way of looking at it is detachment swami shivananda of the divine life society used to always say detach and attach so detach from the things that agitate the mind from the in the world of manifestation and attach to that supreme self detach and attach and that practice has to be all the time going on detach from sense gratification attach to that supreme self then selfless service the selfless service when it is done it should be done with a sense of egolessness not to fan the ego as it were but to actually be do it selflessly where the ego itself out of pure gratitude the ego is completely vanquished i am not doing it but the opportunity has been provided to this body mind to be able to do that service the idea of selfless service is not to boost the ego but to lower the ego with a sense of gratitude and the feeling of humility and then connect with nature which amar ji very beautifully spoke about uh, how anil ji keeps sending these whatsapp messages that speak about and talk about connection with nature which is a very very important aspect because that nature which is there is in every sense presenting itself as that pure changeless consciousness represented in the form of the manifested uh, nature and then devotion devotion is where one is the similar to the ishwar pranidhan that devotion to that either manifested form of divinity or that unmanifested form of the supreme either way it leads to the same goal which is a sense of peace serenity calm egolessness vanquishing of doership etc and the mind gets thinned out when the mind gets thinned out automatically these insights on the path towards divinity when the mind gets thinned out leads one because the doership is going and gone it reveals one's true nature because that is what one truly is always but the barrier is only because of the doership which is i one is always that one is always that changeless one is always that absolute pure self one is abiding as self one is abiding as silence the break in the silence is the experience of the world and when one focuses on the world the silence is broken right 
when one detaches from that worldly uh, gratification and attaches to that self, silence fills that gap. And one is always but always in silence, which one always is. But that apparent illusory sense of gap filling with the manifestation as I, me, myself, doership breaks that. Illusory, though it may be, but it does cause that feeling that I am this. When that is gone, silence pervades as it always has, always is and always will be. Because that is one's absolute true nature. That is the insight because that insight is an expression that is expressed when the abiding as silence and abiding as self becomes not up and down, up and down, but permanent all the time, then functioning just flows, the body-mind functioning flows, and that ab abiding as self is ever-existing, the changeless and the changing are flow in and flow, it continues and goes on until the body drops away as it did in the case of uh, Ramana Maharshi, the body dropped away after 40 years of being in that abiding as self, abiding as silence. But then that what we call as Ramana Maharshi is not gone anywhere because he said, where can I go? I am that ever pure ever existing reality absolute pure consciousness what you term and what you see as this body mind is only limited it will fall away and that is the case with everyone who consider themselves as this ego body mind intellect because all there is is that one That non-dual, absolute, pure self. Abiding always as silence. You can't go anywhere. Oh. We'll just do a small prayer. O oh, adorable Lord of mercy and love, salutations and prostrations unto Thee, Thou art omnipresent, omnipotent and omniscient. Thou art Satchidananda. Thou art the indweller of all beings. Grant us an understanding heart, equal vision, balanced mind, faith, devotion and wisdom. Grant us inner spiritual strength to resist temptations and to control the mind. Free us from egoism, lust, greed, hatred, anger and jealousy. Fill our hearts with divine virtues. Let us behold thee in all these names and forms. Let us serve thee in all these names and forms. Let us ever remember thee. Let us ever sing thy glories. Let thy name be ever on our lips. Let us abide in thee forever and ever. Let us abide in thee forever and ever. Om. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vijay Ji. Uh, well uh, summarized and uh, the part that you spoke about silence was uh, very beautiful. Uh, you know, it uh, the senses suddenly wake up and focus on, you know, that the presence of the silence. Uh, and thank you, uh, Amar Sooji, as well, for a really excellent and a beautiful uh, uh, presentation. 
And thanks to everyone for having given their time to join. I hope uh, uh, the discussion has been of some use, uh, you know, in our uh, spiritual journey. Thank you.